Hello friends, this is William Owens, still somehow managing to broadcast my voice from the depths of a faraway galaxy. Sometimes a disaster can mean the end of many things, but it may also signify a time of beginnings. Sometimes, when everything around you has fallen to pieces, the only option is to move on, to escape to new frontiers. Friends. If tonight you choose to listen to my voice, then listen well, for I have quite a strange tale for you this evening. I shall try to relate the events of my week to you, dear listeners, though it pains me to recall the tragic events I discovered in the tiny town of Grub Canyons. Monday evening, I tried my hand at some simple home cooking, attempting an especially delicious and spicy curry recipe, which I learned from some Nepalese monks back on Earth. Unfortunately, I'm afraid adding sriracha to the mix overdid the whole thing a bit. Not only was it too spicy to consume, but I soon found myself passing into a hot sauce-induced coma, full of nightmares and other terrors of the unconscious mind. I awoke Tuesday to that familiar vibration, the ignition of the strange engine that drives my studio through the void. <laughs> Upon landing, I emerged from the studio onto the outskirts of what appeared to be, for all intents and purposes, a perfectly idyllic village built on the edge of a vast desert. Although it was night, the light of a slightly purple, mostly silver moon illuminated what reminded me of an old, Wild West-style mining town. The banner which hung over the entrance read, Welcome to Grub Canyons, the mining man's paradise, a Dynecorp company town, next to which was a cartoon caricature of a buff, slightly insectile man with four eyes, wearing a yellow hard hat. I quickly realized two very odd, and in combination rather disconcerting things. Firstly, the town was silent. I mean, dead silent. No footsteps. No music, no coughs or clearing of throats, just the wind and the sound of disused hinges. Secondly, despite its apparently empty state, the town was remarkably well taken care of. Though all of the buildings were made from simple, raw wooden planks, some of their roofs had been painted in sort of earthy colors, red and green mostly. The paint was so immaculately tended to were so well preserved that I failed to detect a single chip or blemish from my position on the outskirts of town. I took a few tentative steps forward, stopping to look over a dark and silent porch, painted pea green and laden with wicker furniture, bearing no hint of dust or dirt. Off in the distance, lights flickered on, drawing my attention to a huge mansion in the center of town. I was just about to turn and make my way towards the illuminated building, when something caught my eye through a nearby window. Inside the house with the pea-green porch, on top of a table lit by dusty moonlight, lay a single piece of crumpled paper. I couldn't make out the writing, but I thought it resembled the untidy scrawl of a child. I was so drawn by this scrap of parchment that I completely forgot about the lights in the center of town. I tried the front door, knocking and pausing for several seconds before twisting the doorknob. It was unlocked, 
and swung open invitingly. I quickly made my way to the table, ignoring the immaculately preserved kitchen in my haste. Picking up the sheet of paper, I proceeded to uncrumple it and read. We've reached home now. I hope it doesn't take Mommy and Daddy too long to return. They told Timothy and I to run away from town, to go home or farther if we had to. Timothy says I should keep writing, that I should tear out the pages of my journal and leave them behind in case someone tries to find us. The ground keeps shaking, shaking like it did the night we saw all the red shooting stars, like it did before Mommy started crying and said to run as far and fast as we could. Timothy seems very sad when I ask how long they're going to be. He just keeps saying, We'll all be together soon, Sadie. I put the letter back in its place, my head abuzz with questions and suspicion. Ignoring the trickling sensation of fear I felt crawling up my spine, I called out to see if anyone was in the house. When no reply came, I made a cursory examination of the premises, detecting nothing amiss except for the absence of food. The entire house was immaculately intact and had the feeling of being lived in, but no food could be found anywhere. Upstairs, I found what I assume were Sadie and Timothy's rooms. Timothy must have been about 15 and clearly had a passion for reading. His living space almost resembled a library more than a child's bedroom. I also found an odd pair of glasses on his desk, with four lenses placed equidistant from one another. Sadie's room brought a tear to my eye. It was dark and silent, a sharp contrast to the multicolored winged elephants that patterned her wallpaper. Tacked to the wall above her bed was a single sheet of paper. A plus was written near the top. Below this, the words, my name is, had been typed. Sadie had filled in Sadie in green crayon. The paper went on. My age is six. My favorite thing is my brother Timothy. My favorite place is the forest I can see outside my window. Upon reading this, I instinctively looked out across the dusty landscape, spying in the distance a few aged stumps I'm not quite sure why I then rose and began to make my way across that mottled and sandy plain. Perhaps I imagined little Sadie, clutching her journal as she ran away from the disaster that claimed her parents, beelining for her favorite place while her older brother tried vainly to keep up with his willful little sister. Huffing, puffing, and covered in a thin layer of sweat, I reached what remained of the forest a clearing dotted with dry stumps. A few yellowed stems poked themselves through the cracked ground, but failed to make any difference in the scarred landscape. I had almost turned to leave when I heard a rustling near my feet. I stooped and again found a single rumpled piece of notebook paper covered in a child's letters. It said, I told Timothy it would be safe in the forest, but he wouldn't listen, so I came here myself. He followed once he saw I'd gone. He said one of the things got the house after he left, that I saved his life by running away. I'm happy, but it scares me too, because I keep thinking about what would have happened if he'd stayed longer. I want to keep running, but if we go any farther, Mom and Dad won't be able to find us. I keep telling Timothy we have to get back into town, get to higher ground. Here, the message ended. I was jolted from my daydreaming by the loud and abrasive clanging of a nearby clock tower. I looked up at it, silhouetted against the night sky, and imagined little Sadie doing the same thing. I ran, nearly sprinted to the bell tower, but I stopped when I got close, feeling an unmistakable vibration beneath my feet. It was different than the humming of the studio, though. This was somehow more organic, as if a planet-sized hive buzzing with bees 
rested beneath the crust of this world. I paused as I reached the tower, and the buzzing seemed to taper off. In the distance, across a twilit desert scape choked with dust and obscured by mist, I thought I saw a mound of earth swell and settle. Although I suspected such a landscape could easily produce a mirage, the sight still managed to fill me with a nameless dread. I was relieved, then, to find a sturdy ladder leading to the top of the tower. I quickly placed my feet on the wooden rungs and pulled myself desperately towards a dim square of moonlight visible in the shadows above. I emerged onto a sort of lookout post, level with a gigantic cast-iron bell, and instantly set about surveying my surroundings. My fear slowly began to fade as I failed to detect even the slightest hint of movement. I spent what must have been a quarter of an hour straining my eyes in the direction of the desert pan, but that hulking mound of earth made no reappearance. Once my pulse settled, and I relaxed enough to take stock of my immediate surroundings, I quickly discovered another page from Sadie's journal, this one less crumpled but more crinkled, as if parts of it had been splashed with water. The page read, I'm all alone now. The ground started shaking when we got close to the tower and a great black hole opened in the ground, filled with row upon row of rotating and gnashing teeth. Climb, Sadie, climb, Timothy yelled as he lifted me onto the ladder. I just climbed as fast as I could, and when I looked back, I was all alone. I don't think Mom and Dad are coming back either. I can see the town square from here. Most of the buildings have been eaten or knocked over by those things. I don't think I can stay here too much longer. I feel like they know I'm here now. I feel like they know. I put the letter back and again looked out over the town. I didn't see a single half-eaten or partially demolished building, despite Sadie's repeat descriptions of the destruction. The suspicions that had been lurking in my subconscious rose to the surface, and I was instantly certain that the whole town was somehow a trap, that the things which had devoured Sadie's village were still lurking underground. I also knew, in that moment, that I could not leave this place, not until I had traced Sadie's trail to its end. Her chances of survival had surely been slim, but if there was any chance she was still alive, I... I had to be sure. Carefully... I climbed back down the ladder, paying special attention to the feeling of the ground beneath my feet as I attempted to stealthily make my way to the lit mansion. I reached the building without incident and nudged the door open with my toe. The mansion remained silent and unremarkable as I gingerly tiptoed through its halls. The only thing distinguishing it from the other abandoned houses was the presence of burning oil lamps which had been carefully placed on each window sill. Upstairs, in the grand master bedroom, another page was partially hidden beneath one of many throw pillows which sat upon the king-sized bed. This one read, I made it inside. Everything was shaking when I ran across the street to the mansion, and I was really scared so I screamed a lot, but it was kind of fun too. Those big, stupid worms can't catch me because I'm too fast. I stopped reading at that point, as a feeling of faintness came over me. Worms, Sadie had written. I knew then what the swelling of earth in the desert distance had been, and why the ground occasionally felt alive with movement. I ignored the gradual vibrations beneath my feet, and continued reading. There is someone else in the house, but it didn't sound like a person or a worm. It clicks when it walks, like when Tim... She had written her brother's name and then scratched it out. Like when I brought that baby goat into the kitchen, and it had those little hooves like hard plastic shoes. Also, I think there's more than one because it was talking, or something, and it makes these kind of squeaky beeping sounds. 
There's something in the backyard, too. I can see it through the window and it glows red. The same color as the shooting stars, which makes me think it's probably bad. I think the things in the house are spending most of their time in the basement. I wonder what's down there. I remembered the floor trembling beneath my feet, and then at once feeling so incredibly ashamed for being afraid. Here I was, a grown man scared of something I hadn't really even seen, while Sadie, the nine-year-old orphan, was just curious about what's in the basement. I squared my shoulders and ignored the persistent rumbling of earth as I made my way down two flights of carpeted stairs to arrive at a dimly lit basement door. As I descended the final step, a rustling sound rose up through the shadows, and I peered through the darkness to see a badly burned scrap of notebook paper. I scooped it off the ground and read Sadie's only sentence. I made some new friends today. Clearly, there had been more, but this piece of journal had been exposed to some very intense heat, and I feared the worst as I opened the door. The basement was a single, large room, well lit by a ceiling lamp and empty, except for a tiny, childlike figure in a blue dress that knelt on the floor with her back to the door. My leg twitched, and I began to take a step toward the little girl. Several things happened at once. My leg froze as I instantly realized how wrong this whole scene was. The journal pages were old. Sadie wouldn't have been waiting here, in this basement, the whole time. And what about the destruction to the town? What about the fact that this whole thing was clearly a trap? Maybe Sadie never even existed. I whirled around and planted my still-raised foot on the first step back upstairs. Immediately, a groaning and splintering of wood reached my ears as the room behind me began to disappear into a wall of rotating, gnashing teeth. I looked back to see the little figure in the blue dress disappear into that hellish vortex, its head turning to reveal the face of a wooden doll. I ran, up the steps, out the back door, across the yard towards the studio. As I sprinted furiously across the lawn, I passed a curious patch of horribly burned earth, as if a small rocket had launched from this very location. I reached the studio successfully, though the earth continued to tremble violently. Through the front window, I saw buildings crumble and fall in the distance, as several gigantic, rust-colored worms burrowed through the soil. Then, without warning, the hideous things lifted up from the ground and I saw that they were all connected to a single mammoth hand. Something darkened the sky, something the size of countries, of continents. I looked away and pounded on the walls of the studio, imploring it to take off, but I felt no stirrings from whatever mechanism drove me through space. In despair, I ran through the studio, retreating from the sight of the gargantuan being Imagine, then, my horror when the floor began to crumble beneath my feet. I jumped haphazardly onto one of the counters in the break room, watching in terror as the floor disappeared and was replaced by a dark tunnel full of rotating fangs. I tried to climb higher, going for atop the refrigerator, and in doing so, accidentally knocked over my bowl of leftover, far too spicy curry I had made the day before. I watched helplessly as both meal and crockery were ground up by the room-sized grub. A few seconds later, the thing just stopped. It made a kind of coughing, gagging noise, and then instantly slithered back down the tunnel from where it had come. I carefully made my way around the edge of the room and up the hallway to the front window. I watched as the gigantic thing in the distance wailed and thrashed in agony. It was a ghastly thing to witness, and I was more than glad when my studio left the ground. After that, I went and sat in the doorway, watching as that terrifying planet grew smaller and smaller beneath me. 
I was just starting to wonder if Sadie had been part of the trap all along, when another page suddenly drifted right past my face. Quick as a wink, I snagged it from the void and read. Everyone was so wrong. The red shooting stars didn't bring the worms. They were here to help us. The worms were always there, beneath the mines. We just hadn't dug deep enough to find them. My new friends say I'm the only one who made it, which is sad, but I guess it's okay too. They say they'll always take care of me, and that I can come with them wherever they go, and that it's always an adventure. I like that. Maybe someday someone will find these pages, and we can go on an adventure together. Bye, everyone I ever knew. I'll always miss you. Sincerely, Sadie. I read the letter twice before putting it into my pocket, and for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel so alone. Perhaps we can all find solace in that, but no matter how lonely you are, someone out there is just as, if not more, lonesome. As for you, friends, I hope your night has been free of loneliness. Maybe you are alone, but my words and your ears have formed a connection. Maybe. It has felt as if we were in the same room, just as I felt little Sadie's feet pounding the dirt at my side as I ran from that terrifying shape. Keep your wits about you, friends. Stay alert and always watch the sky. And if you see a shape, not terrifying, but familiar, whirring through the stars above, I hope you'll wave, for it could be me up there. And perhaps, if enough people look up and wave, Perhaps someday I can find my way home. You've been listening to Space Cadet, a podcast written and produced by Andy Fleming and scored by Jules Bonner, featuring artwork contributed by Jesse James. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe to it on iTunes and like our Facebook page. Social media can be a powerful force, so powerful that many quantum pseudoscientists are considering adding it to the list of fundamental forces, alongside gravity, electromagnetism, and gossip. Feel free to contact us by emailing william.spacecadet at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.